Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, this is our second webinar from our project partners. Hopefully some of you joined us earlier this week. If you didn't, welcome. I'm going to run through some of the same things that we did on Tuesday. So apologies if you've already heard this. So um, I am Poppy Townsend. I am the communications manager on the UKRI Net Zero Digital Research Infrastructure Scoping Project. So a little bit of boring housekeeping stuff. Um, you're all doing a great job of staying muted, so thank you very much for that. Um, you can have your videos on if you'd like to. It's nice to see some faces in the room, but if you don't want to, don't, no problem. Um, questions will be at the end of each individual's talk, and then we'll hopefully have time at the end for some discussion as well. So if you'd like to raise a question, you can either use the raise hand function um, on the bottom bar under reactions, or you can use the Zoom chat and I can read it out. Um, so the webinar is going to be recorded, so we'll share that after, maybe next week probably. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, then please stay muted with your video off. So um, a little bit of a reminder, um, if you don't know who we are, this is the core project team. Um, we're all based in the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis. And if you want to introduce yourself to people on the call, it would be nice to, to see who we've got here and, wh and where you're from and why you're interested in joining. So feel free to do that in the chat. OK, so um, I'm just going to give us a little bit of a recap about um, what we've done so far. And um, then I will introduce our wonderful speakers Then we'll have some time for questions and then we'll talk about some next steps as well. So first of all, taking it back the way back to the beginning, just in case anyone isn't clear. So what is digital research infrastructure? So this is a screenshot from UK Research and Innovations website at this URL at the bottom. Um, but basically, digital research infrastructure is anything to do with um, computing or research. So it can be anything from supercomputing to large scale data storage facilities like long term storage. But it can also include things like um, the software and the data analysis that researchers um, do on that data. It also includes things like how we access those supercomputers in different facilities. Um, and of course, the people behind it, so the people who use these infrastructure and also the experts who uh, develop and maintain and keep the infrastructures going. So in our scoping project, we are collecting, I'm actually going to skip on to the next slide and, do, and go backwards, I forgot to reorder them. So um, our ambition for the project, firstly, is to collect evidence to inform uh, future investment decisions for UKRI's digital research infrastructure. And um, from the evidence that we are collecting, we are going to provide UKRI and its wider community with an outline, road, an outline roadmap for how we can actually get the DRI to um, net zero. So we're going to be writing some recommendations, some of which you'll hear from our project partners today. And then finally, um, this will enable UKRI to play a positive and leading role in uh, the wider transition to a net zero future. So now I'm going to go back to the, to the evidence slide. So how are we collecting this evidence? So we've got lots and lots of project partners, some of which you may have heard from on Tuesday, some of them you're going to hear from today. Um, and then in the core team, we're also doing some other evidence collecting work, like a literature survey and um, lots of meetings and events and engaging with people and get, gathering feedback. So, so there's lots of things going on um, alongside what you're going to hear about today. I think it's the main point of this slide. OK, and I said we've got lots of project partners here, the logo soup of all of them that um, we have partnered with. So we've got about 40 researchers from 20 different institutions, which brings a huge range of experience to the project. So uh, this slide shows our project partners. Um, it's a little bit confusing, but I'll talk you through it. So the green box at the top is covering all of the projects that we talked about on Tuesday in webinar one. And they all kind of fall under a, th a theme of machines and workflows or 
um, technical and operational challenges. And then all the ones at the bottom are focus in today's webinar so webinar two, two and that's all about people and processes and kind of um, community and organizational challenges and then on the left hand side we have got the project partners that were funded via our sandpit event so these were all new ideas from the community um, that we funded and then the ones on the right are from our consortium partners so these are ideas that were initiated within the original project proposal and we went and approached we and the project core project team went and approached members of the community to to do these ones so um that's a bit of a summary of of our project partners work but most importantly um, you're here to listen to our wonderful project partners. So today's theme is community and organisational challenges. So each talk is going to be roughly 10 minutes and we're going to have about two minutes um, for questions after each one. And then afterwards at the end of the webinar today, I'll discuss the next steps in the wider project and we'll have a bit of an open discussion at the end. So this is our running order. order. We're going to go from left to right. Um, so yeah. I am going to stop sharing the screen and then we're going to hear from the Aaron's rep team first of all, I think. Have we got Adrian? Yeah, hi folks. Hi Adrian. Um, so, I, so I'm on my way to collect my cat, so I'm sitting in the corner of a pub. Um, so I'm also trying to eat my uh, um, lunch such that they don't check me out. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's see how we, how we get on. Well, I hope uh, your cat's on. okay. We can hear you fine, so you're all good. Well, that's great. Let me just so um, although we tested it earlier, um, the uh, slideshow window is not showing as one of my options to capture. Let me just throw that one more time. It's okay, no problem. Yeah, that one's there. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Right, I'm just going to quit PowerPoint and reopen PowerPoint again. No worries. The other thing we can do is, did you send your slides to Katie? Katie yeah, I've, I've, I've changed changed them a little bit. Oh, okay. um, or Adrian Jackson has said that he can share them if you want. Yeah, him. no, it's okay. Well, let, let's, I hope it's okay. Let's just try and get this <laughs> We'll give it again. a go. One more go. Right, back in the Zoom. As long as I don't have to quit. Okay, I'm just going to have to try and share my whole desktop. Can you see that? I can if you just expand it. Yeah, okay. That's a shame because that's not what I wanted to do. I'll just make, try and make it full screen then. Right, so that's annoying because I was going to use my speaker notes and now I can't. Uh, so, so I it and I apologise for the acronym. Um, we put no thought into that. It's just the abbreviation of the project title that was for sort of innovation towards net zero. Um, this was work we did. University of Bristol. Caroline Bird did the heavy list, lifting with Chris Priest. Caroline Lord, Kelly Widdix, and myself over on Friday at Lancaster University. Adrian Jackson, who's from EPCC, you can see is on the call. Thank you, thank you for joining, Adrian. Uh, and Gabon and Simon Lambert from STFC are also part of the project. Um, so what did we set out to do? So we were quite, we were interested in, this is a qualitative um, investigation, not quantitative, unlike the projects from a couple of days ago. And it's about exploring the wider socio-cultural influences um, affecting DRI provision and use. And we're sort of trying to think broadly, not just oh, about- Greg Davis. Ooh. Is that, did everyone hear that? Was that me? It's okay. I think someone was unmuted. I've muted them now. So you're fine. Okay. <laughs> you. uh, that's right. Um, and it, it was really about trying to map the landscape of what are the drivers, not just about the efficiency of computation itself, but what drives the growth of infrastructure. And we can see on Thursday that there, an awful lot is about the infrastructure and, and just the running cost of that, irrespective of, of the computation you're doing um, and what drives that. So what we did is we, we sort of tried to find stakeholders from providers, funders, uh, users, and sort of people who support that within uh, institutions that we could get access to. We then tried to get in their diaries in the time scale, which was really hard, uh, and interview them, 
Uh, we then transcribed and thematically coded those. Uh, and then each of the investigators got to read about nine of those. Um, uh, and we came together in a workshop. You can see this picture of post-it notes. We sort of pulled out the themes from the coding and, and our reading of that and, and built out the key themes. And we put that together into some thematic groups that formed the sort of policy recommendations. So what did we promise to deliver? Um, well, we decided actually to produce a, whoops, a short um, policy briefing. So this hasn't got a proper digital home at the moment, but if you scan that QR code, it just takes you to my Dropbox at the moment. But that's just a four pager that sort of is essentially this presentation in a, in a slightly fuller form. Um, we then really wanted this mapping of uh, what informs what, what leads, uh, drives the growth. Uh, and that QR code in the middle bottom there takes you to one of our work in progress uh, loopy diagrams. Um, and I, I've got a little example of that in a minute. I'll just show you what that is. Um, but it's trying to sort of set out the influencing factors and, and, and head towards um, what you might seek, where you might seek to influence. And then there's a full report coming and we're, we're sort of working on that right at the moment. It's not quite ready yet. So here's a loopy diagram. So this is the bit I've changed. That wasn't in the PDF I sent. Um, and if I can click play, you'll see what it does. This is not quantitative anyway, anyway, but it just sort of gives you a sense of if you if you um, increase demand, you can see the arrow flows across to um, you know the growth in HPC itself. And if you sort of click on ease of use, um, maybe that makes it more accessible to students and embedding in education which leads to more embedding within the discipline, which leads to more increase in demand, which increases to more HPC. So they, these things are all sort of interrelated. Now, this isn't about magnitudes, but it's about influences. And um, we were gonna try and do one map, but actually it looks like we're gonna have about three or four of these now, uh, which yeah. explore different things like efficiency and, and various other things. Um, oops. So what are the key findings? So I'm just going to pull out some headlines with a bit of a view on the clock. So, I mean, it's probably a surprise to no one that we think digital research infrastructure is increasing, um, but that's not just the traditional drivers within the disciplines where this normally occurs. There's an embedding of machine learning and AI into research domains across into, you know, computational biology, even across into social sciences, both as a subject of study in, in sort of STS and, and other areas of social sciences, but um, those methods are finding a home. And so, so the sort of traditionally people you wouldn't expect to be engineering software for, for DRI uh, are, are being required to do so as part of their, their research as well. So it's sort of spreading and getting pervasive, which grows demand, which grows supply. Um, we're also seeing sort of expectations getting embedded you know you're starting to see these elements expected uh, and certain sort of shapes of evaluation and so on and and rigor around that which which mandates certain amounts of computation uh, in the methods um and i suppose the key point here is the promise is sort of innovation and knowledge but these sort of techniques are also in some cases kind of fashionable and then get embedded into funding calls and then go around an even longer loop that leads to um to growth of, of the infrastructure itself. And it's probably the growth of infrastructure that lays down the ongoing energy demand um, going forward. Um, we think that um, there is, our informants told us that there is, is duplication of platform and resources uh, that's wasteful. And some of that is to do with um, things like inherited code and poor software information, um, uh, it's software engineering, but also sort of code lagging behind the latest hardware. We saw on Thursday the use of FPGAs and GPUs and that some of the, the software hadn't kept up with the latest high efficiency um, sort of accelerators. Um, and so, so there's sort of improvements there. Um, but also we saw some sort of, you know, people inheriting code bases or, you know, the way things are done, which, which, which lags probably the cutting edge there as well. Um, we also saw waste in terms of things like procurement processes, you know, someone gets a grant at a particular time, it's faster to buy one infrastructure than get access to another infrastructure, so they then procure that and it gets delivered maybe early and then not used or it gets um, delivered too late. And we, we, we saw a little bit of um, uh, fears over things like putting health data on shared resources that meant it was done locally rather than 
uh, on shared infrastructure or there's duplication specific purposes uh, as well. Um, oops, sorry. Um, uh, we, we looked a little bit at, at the sort of fair data and the sharing data, and we, we felt that it could there could be much better embedding of, of the supporting tools and services here. Um, and I suppose a specific fair, uh, fear, 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 fear there was that people might be redoing work that had already been done through not accessing pre-existing results. Um, and we felt that these sort of trade-offs between recomputing things and um, looking at what was already out there, plus persisting sort of code and data going forward was it was a poorly understood trade-off and there, there is more work to be done uh, there. Um, there's a lot of sort of folk uh, knowledge. I think, whoops, it's not clicking forward quite as I expected. Um, sorry, let's try that again. Um, it's, it, it's quite hard for people to know whether they're making good decisions about um, whether it's more efficient to use shared infrastructure or their own infrastructure, how much sort of computation and carbon intensity is involved in, in the jobs that they're computing. There's a sort of, I think we pointed out on um, Tuesday, there's poor um, sort of inconsistent tools for getting that information. So it's actually very hard um, for people to make those decisions. And there's sort of heuristics like runtime being used instead as a, as a proxy for this. So I think a lot more could be done on the tools and the knowledge on, uh, around that. So, um, and I, I, th I thought this was, um, kind of a really important point um pretty much everyone we spoke to said that there was no real ownership or embedding of of, of pressure to to be working towards net zero at, at essentially all levels um you don't have to account for it when you publish papers because no one's asking for you to put it in the paper you don't have to account for it when you bid for funding and the funders are not considering it um there's no one to go to for advice there's no embedding of research software engineers to help you create better code and um, better culture around more efficient code and better choice of use of DRI. Um, I mean, pretty much uh, this quote says it all really, there is zero pressure, nothing changed after the, the climate emergency announcement at, at the institution where this, this person was. Um, so, so I think that speaks to a, to a much greater need to embed it. But, it, but it also speaks to some fundamental trade-offs about um, who meets the costs if that's not the sort of cost efficient thing and, and where some of these trade-offs are between shared and, and new DRI. So what, how are we gonna get there? Um, well, we, we want, we've got some recommendations for, for different stakeholder groups. I'll, I'll just kind of show all of these so that you can be reading them while I'm talking um, because we're running out of time. Um, so we, we thought there was a need for much better disclosure around um, uh, you know, assessing sort of when DRI is built and also uh, in use sort of, sort of data and measurement uh, about the impacts of, of jobs on DRI. So we may make evidence-based decisions, both at runtime and procurement time. Oops, I'm out of time. Um, we thought that we could embed much better policies around fair and net zero. Um, but actually what we needed to do was introduce more of a cultural shift towards um, considering net zero in, in the academic community with sort of statements embedded into uh, the work actually. Um, and this needed to carry through to much better training um, across the board in, in sort of costing these things, but also training people um, so they make better decisions around, around net zero uh, DRI. Um, and I, th I think that's all I've got time for. But I, but I hope you'll um, uh, read the report. Um, so let me fly back to the QR code. Um, thanks, Adrian. You're very good at timekeeping. I didn't even have to wave frantically at you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if anyone's got any questions for Adrian and the team, if you want to raise your hand or if you want to put anything in the chat, well, maybe Adrian has explained it incredibly clearly and you're all desperate to read the report in full detail. <laughs> I hope so, because uh, ironically, when I, I ran it through really it, it, it took five minutes when I ran through it. So I don't know what I did there. No, I, I think it's great. Um, I'm just keeping an eye. 
Martin in the chat has said the zero pressure quote is great. Well, great, but also a bit dispiriting. <laughs> well, yes, very dispiriting. But, 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 great, but, yeah. in, great in the sense that it, um, it really clearly summarises what we all think is the main concern yeah. and issue here, I think. Yeah, I think it's um, it's great to have it coming out now. It's good timing in a sense because we, we can actually do something about it. Um, and there is quite a good chance that next year there might be something in place to create a bit of pressure because there are, are people in UKRI who, who are keen to do that. And I think this adds quite a lot of ammunition to that. So it's in that sense, it's good to see it now. So thanks. No, you're, you're very welcome. I, I have to say, I re really enjoyed the little project. It, it, it's, it feels to me like the opposite of a massive collaboration. You know what I mean? You get to do a small focus people work with people who are really committed and some really interesting stuff came out in a very short space of time. So I think it's been a, a good journey actually. Right. Um, I've just spotted a uh, thing in the chat from Fergus. Fergus, mm. I don't know if you want to, you've got your hand up, sorry. Are you going to expand or are you going to ask another no, question? No, no, I wasn't really going to, I won't expand on the chat because it is a somewhat rhetorical okay. question, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, I mean, it's interesting, Adrian, because a lot of, a lot of the points that you hit, as much as you're approaching it from a net zero perspective, actually, it, we see this across the board, even if you're coming from you know, an entirely different perspective to net zero. So for example, orphaned code, the efficiency of code, all of these sort of things, the software, leg, you know, I guess the legacy of um, of software and how that sort of gets carried forward um, is also an issue we see everywhere, right? So it's nice to see that it resonates, not only when you approach it from a net zero point of view. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we, we've been seeing it, we're doing a little bit of work with PCMS at the moment um, based on, on this, which is looking at streaming. And, and really we're seeing the same kind of thing it's the laying down of the infrastructure and the growth of the infrastructure that's driving the demand and, and the actual streaming part uh, and, and the network routing and all that kind of stuff is small compared to just having the provision for the peak loads uh, and it's I think it's very much the same thing here um, we're seeing you know computation around the deadlines and peak running and, and that drives another cycle of growth to the next infrastructure which lays down the energy demand uh, for the next 10 years, you know, and, and, and that, that's, that's a tough thing to stop, but I think that's the thing we have to try and address. Um, I think we are going to hand over to the next speaker now, so Jack, are you ready to introduce your project um, value? Cool, I should be showing my screen now. I can see your screen, yeah. Great. Alrighty, well, yes, my name is Jack Bolton from Harriet Watt, and I'm part of the value and it's zero decision making team. So very quickly, uh, we're here because we are not on track to meet climate safe goals. There's a huge gap in between what's expected and what's needed. And to, to a bit of an indication, if we reduce about 10% of emissions per year, we're going to be crossing uh, the 20% threshold about 2040 just a bit of standard background. So our project specifically has been around thinking about the value that's created by our actions and how we compare this with your emissions. Um, so part one of this was DRI resource allocation within UKRI, how it's currently done and what the existing structures are. Part two was a literature review of how other organizations approach these emissions versus value comparisons. And then part three is the recommendation based off the first two. So the work in part one included communication with a few people from UKRI and a meeting with Ag Stevens, which was very informative. Basically, there's a huge range of equipment and facilities that have been set as in scope for this project, and work has been done in parallel, of course, to figure out what these are. Because of this varied and currently unknown profile, uh, the recommendations of this project were designed to be higher level and as flexible as possible to different facilities. It was found that there was no formal methodology for allocating DRI across the councils, and that the usual processes have occurred where resource management frameworks are only set up when resource limits are approached, such as financial budgets or physical infrastructure capacity. Uh, for part two, um, in this work, we are defining value as the benefit that undertaking a task generates for an organization. So in a for-profit organization, this value is simply how the, the task would affect current profits or future profits, whereas for non-profits and public organization, uh, we require more complex systems to identify what your goals are and assess 
how your actions are progressing towards them. So in this field of performance measurement systems, there's a wide range of methods that are used by different organizations. Some are listed here, such as public value scorecard, intangible benefits approach, and expert elicitation. They all involve comparison back to an organization's stated goals. The differences then start to come out about methods for judgment, estimation, direct quantification, and um, benefits. So I originally expected to spend the bulk of my time getting into the nitty-gritty of these different methods. Uh, and while the full literature review can be found in my report, the main learnings were that the more the direct the quantification is, the more time and effort it takes, and that each organization or department will cater a specific method to their own circumstances. Uh, considering this and the vastly different nature of different facilities that are considered within the scope of DRI, the research then slightly shifted towards presenting a spectrum of value comparison methods that could be used by different facilities and a supported framework uh, to ensure that these comparisons, as well as other innovations, will actually result in emissions reductions along climate safe pathways. And the supported framework that was investigated was task schedulers and how awareness of energy use and the change in carbon intensity of the electricity grid um, could be used to efficiently schedule tasks within an emissions budget. The value comparison then comes in as the prioritization method of the schedulers, uh, which either directly or indirectly answers that question of comparing values with emissions generated. Um, and for tasks that do end up get, getting deemed low priority, it isn't that they simply won't get run, that maybe they need to be scheduled for a period of lower carbon on the grid, or feedback is provided to rewrite them in a more energy efficient way. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about my literature review of schedulers, as I'm sure there's a lot of people on the call who are quite familiar with them. But the interesting point I want to make is that to know about what resource constraints the schedulers are treating as key. So here we have three different schedulers from literature uh, that use temporal shifting to increase utilization of renewable energy. Uh, the key difference from these to my design is the overarching constraint that is optimized within. So as these are from area of climate awareness, but no real commitments or actions, the, net, uh, the key constraints are the traditional resource limits of infrastructure capacity and financial electricity budgets. And then the resulting percentage increases in renewable energy utilization seem to be seen as nice to have improvements rather than kind of founding directives of their design. And in our era of net zero pledges and low carbon roadmaps, it means that emissions reduction needs to be a planned part of the system rather than just a co benefit. Um, so I very want to quickly just touch on temporal shifting here. And uh, here we have the electricity demand for Great Britain in January of last year, and below it is the wind generation. Um, I know that everyone's aware of intermittency of renewables, but I just want to reiterate that increasing capacity will multiply the effects of intermittency. So for example, even if we could couple our current uh, wind farm capacity, we would have huge periods of overcapacity, and, but still periods of undersupply where dispatchable fossil loads or stored energy discharge is needed. And while the materials of storing potentially weeks of a nation's energy use could be questionable, the high environmental embedded carbon and financial costs that are associated with this type of grid level storage and its surrounding infrastructure mean that there's always going to be huge incentives to shift our energy use in line with what renewables are producing. Um, so going off this, the overall very um, blunt recommendation is to implement the UK to implement some sort of system that monitors emissions from DRI use and then alters it in line with the diminishing allowance required for an exit pathway. And a specific example of this would be an energy use register and a flexible smart carbon schedule system. So by energy use register, what I mean is a register that keeps track of the energy use estimations of all things that are all, all DRI that's considered in scope for this commitment. Uh, the key recommendation is that this would use a principle of differentiated scrutiny to apply different levels of uh, detail or granularity to different facilities, depending on how much energy they use. Uh, the reason for this is simply to focus efforts on areas that need the most emissions reduction. So this is an example of what a flexible carbon, smart carbon scheduler might look like. Um, scheduler receives a task, prioritizes it until queued by the chosen method, and outputs them to the hardware as allowed by run criteria. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the prioritization method would act as this value comparison method. These could range from very direct scoring quantification, a relative comparison between two tasks, or self-scoring by users, which we use similar design principles to that of common pool resource, or even no prioritization at all. Get away with it. Uh, different facilities would be obviously different to, to different methods, and this is an area that will probably require a fair amount of additional work during implementation for a specific location. The scheduler also has awareness of electro, the, um, carbon intensity of the electrical grid, 
um, and to set carbon tolerance. So there are several websites that provide forecasts of grid carbon intensity in different parts of the UK. Uh, some of these, though, can be overly optimistic as they ignore the non-trivial emissions associated with renewable energy infrastructure. And there is a larger discussion to be had about how you would assign emissions to marginal energy use at any given time. But the unavoidable fact is that there is large incentives to shift our energy demand in line with the intermittency of renewable energy production. So another key part about the system is, of course, the emissions tolerance or carbon budget. Now, I know the idea of a carbon budget may seem like a large jump for some people, but I really want to stress that by committing to a hard date for net zero and committing to a pathway towards it, we've already set an implicit carbon tolerance pathway. Whether this is monitored by a hard set budget or simply retrospectively monitored checkpoints for council, council, there is still this underlying implication that our tolerance for emissions will no longer be infinite and must reduce. So there is much work to be done about how you would uh, assign various budgets to different facilities in an equitable way. A uh, simple option would just be to cap at the current levels and decrease 10% per year. Um, but the overall message here is that this, from this work is that we need to be approaching these problems as one of resource allocation. Um, it may seem foreign to give a person or group the power to distribute emissions, but we do this already in various ways for other limited resources, such as financial budgets and infrastructure capacity. Already there are systems in place at UKRI that determine which councils or facilities get access to funds and distributing very sought after equipment between facilities as it goes on. Uh, there may not be one rule for all, of course, but there will need to be some systems to support self allocation of this resource. Um, while I'm well aware that this diagram simplifies many complex processes, such as DRI being one neat and pretty box there, of which I'm sure it isn't, and unpacking these relationships of how each piece of DRI behaves with temporal relationship to tasks would be of great importance, but um, is out of scope for the higher part of this project. And exact emissions tracking of DRI is out of the scope of this project. There's uh, you know, other projects with on it. And, but it is really recommended that uh, simple energy use estimates are just paired with publicly available ele electrical intensity information to begin with, and adding in more detailed emissions when applicable. And getting the system up and running with these estimations will allow the paradigm shifts and the associated learnings to start happening as soon as possible. And further functionality can always be added on top of this framework, such as awareness of embedded carbon of infrastructure. Uh, this would allow the scheduler to optimize between uh, those trade offs between high utilization of infrastructure, and high responsiveness of the system. And yeah, just while we're on the time, this is a flexible high level system and it's designed to fit in with and inform on other emissions reduction projects while ensuring that a facility is on track to net zero. And yeah, moving forward, it would be great to develop these ideas in connection to a specific facility. And I feel like there's a huge opportunity to implement the bigger principles surrounding this work. Um, yeah, thank you all. And we have so many questions as there is. Um, thanks, Jack. I think you're almost exactly on time. Oh, and my, my alarm's about to go off in a second, so I apologize if you hear it in about 10 seconds time. Um, Right, so if you can stop sharing, Jack, and then we'll be able to see people's faces. There so you go, there's the alarm. Perfect, I'm keeping. Um, there is some stuff in the chat. If anyone wants to ask Jack any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, if not, I'm going to scroll back and try and look for some of the questions. So there's one from Adrian Jackson in the chat saying, for the scheduling work, Jack, it looks like the focus is really active carbon, i.e. electricity to run the DRI. Do you see the requirement to include embodied or embedded carbon as well? I think that was like maybe my last sentence was um, addressing that very briefly, saying that, um, uh, yeah, definitely an exclusive at the moment. I would very much love to include it in the future. I think there's one of the presentations two days ago that it was ranges between maybe 10% to 50% of total um uh, carbon usage would be uh, embodied and yeah i think with systems like this it's like the not you know optimizing for multiple factors is really kind of uh, normal in a lot of these schedules and i think it'd be a really great thing to add to it but i haven't specifically delved into it to do that thing for schedules to try and optimize it okay um there's loads going on in the chat so um if anyone is desperate to read those out, Mary, you've got a hand right. up. Do you want to go whilst I try and catch up with the chat? You ask your question, Mary. Um, yeah, I, uh, first of all, thank you very much. We have to move on this. So the fact that you've done that and set up a framework is very helpful. I mean, clearly for it to become operational, it needs loads of things built underneath it. 
Do you have any examples where something like this is already in place and being used? So um, in terms of examples, there was uh, like there's quite a few similar ones from literature that were around um, taking like one facility, one data center, and then looking at one like renewable energy located towards it. And then there was there's like similar processes of trying to then optimize temporal shifting with their tasks to utilize that renewable energy and yeah, various different types of things like that. Mm -hmm. I'd say there wasn't maybe as broad of a scope, like they're all quite kind of maybe narrow. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Applications. So, yeah, I haven't seen one that's kind of attempted to scale across different sort of sizes. Yeah, uh, it, it, would, it would help to know things that have happened within our community. So that's more persuadable if you can see that a facility has actually done this. So kind of a that would tie up into some other work we're doing. That's one thing. And the second thing is the narrow width. So this is just about one thing, which is turning your computer on and something running. Um, and there's so many other aspects to how we, in digital infrastructure, how we spend carbon. Um, so we just need to kind of delineate that um, yeah, so I kind of see it as the, the scheduler being very much one type of solution to, um, to it's one allocate this. Solution. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah, but it very much is that broader topic of how do you treat resource the resource allocation within the community of the emissions. And yeah, and the, what la the last, and the last con con thing I had was that um, uh, the map is very good, but it you might need to test it against uh, various decision makers because they won't see the world quite the same way. Hundred percent, yeah. For sure. so and I'm, it was I'm happy to have a look at it. One. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to have a look at it with a board perspective because that's where a lot of decisions are made. So if you if you want to set up, yeah, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, I'd be yeah, really then, happy to have a look at that. And I see that Nick Beard is online as well. He might also be it, useful. We're both non-execs on. Um, uh organizational boards and we'd be very happy to do that i'm sorry volunteer you nick <laughs> i think it sounds like there's lots of lots of um extra things that could be done as we've seen with all of these projects so yeah jack I mean, yeah. loads of scope to do lots more things um, yeah, and yeah. hopefully as martin i think martin said last week hopefully there will be some more concrete sort of ideas about where the where the future money might come from for this um they um conscious of time john you've got your hand up can i ask you to pop it in the chat and then maybe jack can reply in the chat and then i think there's one more question in the chat from andrew turner so jack if i could leave you to look at the chat if that's okay yeah, and then I'll we maybe go on fab and we go yeah. on to our next speaker who i'm just okay. reminding Thank myself of is so it's the go zero team i think it's niall are you presenting niall have i got that right yep that's right so i'm just sharing my screen now hi everybody yeah. Okay, you should be able to see my screen, hopefully. We can. We can't see your face, but if you don't want to show your camera, that's fine. I just don't know if it's on purpose or not. Yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a cold and I'm wearing a dressing gown no and problem. a woolly hat. And Absolutely and fine. hot water bottles. It looks a bit of a mess, really. Um, you. you carry on so as you I are. May, I may cough a little bit as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Florian and I will be will be presenting today. Um, I'll talk about more about the methodology um, and Florian will, will talk a bit more about the, the findings and the results. Um, so yeah, it's it's a fairly big team uh, led by uh, Danai Manika at University of, or Bruno University, I think it is, yes. Um, and the idea is to um, basically, rather than impose tech solutions to get us to net zero, um, wouldn't it be great if uh, for a change, we, we involve people, involve the community and uh, maybe listen to their ideas. So um, this is all a bit of a, a, a new idea for the tech, industry but um uh yeah so I'll, I'll, I'll go through that and i'll just keep an eye on the time right so um what we wanted to do was hold three workshops um spaced out every two weeks each workshop was four hours um and in each workshop we uh asked the attendees some questions and invited them to discuss those um i'll go through a little bit more about the what each workshop entailed um, in the next few slides. Um, but what we wanted to do was to kind of create a, a reusable template or toolkit for running workshops uh, of this nature. Um, we wanted to look at how we could bring um, different parts of the uh, UKRI DRI user community together. 
Um, and we wanted to start looking into how we could encourage people to develop plans for getting to net zero. So actions that they would they would take or that they would take or their teams would take to um, to get towards net zero. So those are the things we wanted to um, explore. And we have got some some recommendations, some ideas that came out of the discussions. Um, there's much more detail in the report, which we'll, we'll, um, we'll show you how you can get that at the end. Um, there are also some net zero recipes that uh, some of the participants put together at the end of the workshop series. So sort of some thoughts about how they were going to, um, to work on getting to net zero. Um, yeah, and we also took some surveys before and after, um, and we were able to measure the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the, the workshops in, in you know, getting people thinking and improving their awareness. Um, in terms of workshop design, um, we had a, a theme for each workshop. So it might've been um, energy or carbon or action plans. Um, we recruited from a, a, a range of different backgrounds so the, in, inside the UKRI DRI community. So we didn't want to have just scientists or just engineers or just policy makers. We wanted to get everyone together. We had some short talks from expert speakers to get people interested and inform them. And then we, we devised some questions to, to ask the participants and we divided into small breakout groups to answer each question and discuss things. Um, so that was the, the general methodology. I'll go through each of the workshops it, it briefly um, and, and put, pull out some interesting findings. So workshop one, we wanted to, to focus people on their energy usage, um, introduce the idea of net zero as well, um, and, and look, think about things they could control and, and things that they couldn't with regards to their their energy usage uh, using the UKRI DRI. Um, a couple of really, really interesting things jumped out. Uh, one one is that we immediately got challenged by people saying, well, why not just ground a few flights? You know, the, the energy use of the UKRI DRI is, is, is you know, negligible compared to the aviation industry. Um, and so, you know, when running workshops like this and getting people involved, we have to really come up with a, with a response to these kind of questions. Um, yeah, just pulling out a few others here. Um, Measuring and monitoring energy use um, is really important. People can't change; they can't, um, you know, make make changes unless they know what their, you know, know what the effects of their changes are. Um, and embodied carbon um, costs were were much higher uh, than maybe people thought. Certainly, than I thought. Um, in workshop two, uh, we looked a bit more at the carbon uh, side of things. So rather than energy, we are now looking at carbon um, and discussing the carbon in intensity of the energy supply. Um, and you know, the participants thought that uh, one of the main things was that um, standardizing the measurement of carbon intensity and carbon usage is really important um, in going back to that measuring and monitoring uh, side of things. Um, Prolonging the equipment lifetimes might be really significant. And, and one of the participants had the, the suggestion that we really optimize the maintenance of equipment that might, that might really help. Um, and, you know, we talked about uh, green schedulers in, in the previous presentation, um, that that might be really uh, important. I'm just conscious of the time here. Um, so in workshop three, we asked people to um, put together their uh, net zero plans, start thinking about actually how they would change their uh, change their activities. And a couple of interesting things came out uh, during the the conversations that tended to kind of be quite wide ranging. Um, so, um, for example, you know there was a feeling that we needed to sort of form communities and um, create training material, um, you know, to help people, bring people together and, and kind of, uh, otherwise everyone's struggling with this on their own. Um, and then also sort of, if that's the bottom up kind of way of looking at things, there's also a sort of top down, you know, what policies um, might encourage good behavior and, and, and punish uh, people who are not 
who are not um you know not playing but not not playing uh properly um so those were the three workshops um i'm going to hand over to uh to florian um to uh start talking through the results are you there florian yes thanks niall great can you hear me all well cool. yep we can we can um thanks so oh yeah perfect um so now we heard a bit about the um detailed findings from the individual workshops but um as niall indicated in the beginning we had um surveys before and after each workshop to sort of track four different things um because we wanted to find out in general, one of our hypotheses, in fact, was that um, this sort of participatory workshop design would actually be able to increase knowledge and intention for net zero action in the, in the DRI environment. And so we, we tested four different things there, um, the perceived knowledge um, on, on net zero DRI, the importance of net zero in general, and um, also the perceived levels of control and also the intentions and what we found out was um, on the one hand side very nice which is that um, perceived knowledge definitely increased throughout our workshop series which is probably um, thanks to the well carefully planned and um, workshop designs and also the the expert speakers that did a great job we know that the importance is generally high which is well wasn't very surprising but in fact um, that the perceived levels of control about actually achieving um, net zero action in the, the, the DRI environment um, were moderate. So that didn't increase th throughout our workshop um, series, which was kind of interesting and also shows that um, running these workshops doesn't really um, directly uh, <laughs> produce actionable knowledge in this sense. However, the intentions of doing um, of, of getting um, your hands dirty, of getting the hands dirty, were actually quite high. So, so that's nice. And I would generally ask our, our ask the question here: um, if knowledge and intention generally will lead to net zero action, which is a wider field of research that's out of scope here, but there was just an interesting question that we sort of finished this um, survey analysis up with. Could you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. Okay, I'm keeping an eye off the time now. I'm trying to wrap this up with a couple of <laughs> sentences. Um, so as you as you heard, we had a, um, a couple of detailed findings from the indiv individual workshops. We had some, some general findings. And out of this whole um, mess of findings, we tried to distill four different um, groups of recommendations, which are, first of all, operational recommendations to reduce carbon emissions which uh, could potentially involve around the whole story, um, topic of data storage, how, how data is being stored. And of course, the very important thing of resource monitoring, we heard about that, um, I think, two days ago. Um, a very interesting point that also um, Jack just um, touched on, I think, is the community and behavior part, which sort of shows that um, it's definitely not an individual effort that whole net zero DRI. It's something that needs to come out of the community and every potential solution or or prototype um, will, also, will also need to be community led. And of course, a very important thing um, to the participants of our workshops were um, was the whole procurement and funding situation, which I think someone was talking about that in the chat as well, that um, procurement and funding isn't really geared towards um, incentivizing and supporting um, low carbon uh, research behavior in this regard um, yet. So that's a huge field of innovation there as well. And on the next slide, we wanted to also, that's a bit of um, informal information there. We just wanted to share um, how we did our workshops in order to I know, help others who are planning to, to do these kind of workshops um, with their, well, method and, and planning of, of the workshop. And basically that's three different things that are very important, which is first of all, of course, um, thinking through it and actually planning it carefully, of course, including a variety of speakers that are experts um, in, in their fields. And a very important thing that's often forgotten about is the ethics approval as well. And um, all right, I think I'm going to wrap this up now with our <clears throat> last slide, which is sort of the future directions. 
And as I said earlier, it's the goal should now be since we have all this amazing pile of, of information from, from the other projects as well, um, to actually start working on actual projects, which means sitting down and thinking about the data that we need and how to get the data that, that might not be there already. And then to actually engineer a prototype, um, road test this prototype within, for example, one institution and then, yeah, see how that went and find out if that might be something for the whole UKRI, DRI um, environment. And it's just, as Jack also indicated with the little graphs at the beginning of his presentation, that it's um, a matter of time now. So you might better start sooner than later. And if you want to find our report, you can find this on a website that we um, created. That's also that's accessible by the little link here, but also by the um, QR code. And with this, I'd like to finish up. Thank you for your attention. Um, thanks, Florian, and thank you, Niall. Um, that was really interesting. Can I get, Niall, can I get you to stop sharing your screen just so it's a little bit easier for me to see you? Who's asking yeah. what? Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, has anyone got any questions? We've got a couple of minutes. And to look between all the millions of screens. Is there any questions? Um, anyone has got their hand up? Uh, the chat is going off, but I can't necessarily see any questions in it. Please, someone shout if I've missed one. Um, Poppy, a very quick question. How do yes, you observe right. the discourse in the chat after the meeting, or can't we? Katie and I will remember to save it. Thank you. And we can share it with whoever wants to see it, but we'll we'll probably do some sort of summary. Are you? I'm looking at oh, Katie. Oh, thinking. Yeah. Katie, are you can do some sort of summary. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Maybe let's leave it there for this one then. Um, and our next speaker is Laura, who is, um, so the last three speakers were our SAMPIT projects, and the next two are from our consortium members. So Laura, you're going to talk about the um, user behaviour survey that you ran. I've just shared the screen. If I go too fast, everybody, I've got lots of things to fit in within this 10 minutes, so I will clarify anything at the end. Um, no problem. Okay, so this um, part of the project was the user behavior survey and I've been working on this with uh, Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte and I designed a survey with uh, motivators and barriers and we sent it out or Charlotte sent it out to get feedback and we received lots and lots of feedback from every, everybody. And we really did use that feedback to inform the final draft. So thank you to everybody who um, had an input into that. It was really useful. Uh, the survey assessed motivators and enablers and also barriers to sustainable action in digital research infrastructure. There were 12 statements grouped under four different categories. There was general behaviour around the workplace, uh, technology and equipment, uh, research and data code and large storage. We also looked at attitudes. Now, attitudes are defined as predispositions to act, and they're usually assessed using self-report questionnaires. And we added a, a Likert scale in this survey, where uh, a, a five-point Likert scale, where five is a positive, explicit attitude to low carbon, one being um, not positive. In addition, we used we measured underlying unconscious attitudes using a computerized sorting task or reaction time task called an implicit association test or IAT. Now, research shows that explicit attitudes are better at predicting conscious behavior or conscious decision making. Implicit attitudes are better at predicting less conscious and habitual behavior. The IAT, and I can go over the IAT in more detail in the question time. Um, but it, just in very briefly, it compares speed of response to uh, different categories. So in this case, it's high carbon, low carbon, paired with different evaluate, evaluative concepts, good and bad. It measures speed of response and error rate um, and yields a D-score. A D-score is the difference in time it takes to respond to one set of paired concepts compared to the other. So a strong uh, positive uh, 
D score. So anything greater than 0.8 indicates a strong positive um, implicit attitude to carbon. All of this was hosted on Qualtrics. Um, in terms of the sample size, we received 284 uh, people who completed the survey. And of that 284, there were 231 who completed the um, implicit the survey and implicit association test. And I have to say thank you to Poppy for helping with the dissemination of that, that survey and sharing it amongst the community. Um, it's important to note here that not all of those 284 completed each question. Some of them weren't applicable and they moved on to the next. So there are different ends between the different questions. Uh, we asked people for their age, the categories, um, for age were between 18 and 75 and over. The um, modal category was 35 to 45. We asked people for their occupation status, their area of re research, how they interact with the um, DRI, et cetera. So just for example, I won't be able to go through all of, uh, all of the statements. I've just picked a few. Um, so in general, I looked to reduce my environmental impact in my workplace and it was really positive. 64.4 selected always or often and only six 0.7 selected rarely or never, but there's always room for improvement. Those sometimes can move to often and those oftens can move to always. In terms of the D score from the IAT, now if you remember 0.8 is a strong positive, well the mean D score here was actually 0.94, which is really positive. And it was it was very it was much po more positive than samples I've been used to working with in the past. This, this was a really uh, positive um, group of people. In terms of the Likert score, again, that was really strong and positive as well. Mean, mean uh, was 4.5, but that's, that wasn't surprising. So people were presented with a series of statements followed by either enablers and, and motivators or barriers. And we wanted to know what encouraged or discouraged their sustainable behavior. Those participants who responded with rarely or never were also asked if they were willing to change their behavior. And we also, um, received lots with an option to put free responses and that can just to justify what they were saying or just give more information or explanations of their reasoning for choosing the motivator or barrier. Um, I've actually got 52 pages of qualitative uh, data in total which is absolutely amazing so I'm doing lots of work with that at the moment. Just one of the, um, an example of one of the enablers from that first statement. Uh, one of the uh, questions or one of the um, enablers was uh, who people would approach for advice when uh, it comes to sustainable behavior around the workplace. Now, only four people said that they would just go to the environmental lead. 139 people said that they would just go to their teammates and 55 said that they would go to both environmental lead and teammates. So this shows that Seeking advice about sustainable action appears to be it's, it's cooperative, it's team based rather than top down. Some of the barriers that came up in the qualitative comments, um, it, it seemed to be that people didn't think that or these are individual comments. So say, for example, one person thought that their efforts would be too small to make any difference. Um, environmental concerns seem to be a very low priority um, in, in the institution, in the company. Um, etc. So there's uh, and the need for knowledge about changing as well. So there, there's many categories there, but the, the, we need to, what we found was that we need uh, to encourage people within the organisation. Uh, the, the need for evidence for, that small changes do make a difference, and clear instructions as to how to incorporate sustainability uh, within the workplace in terms of their behaviour. Uh, in terms of those who uh, who said that they didn't that who said they didn't um, think about the environmental impact in their workplace, people did say that they were willing to change, that they were willing to to consider the environmental impact. But if you look at the numbers, the student and the earlier careers, what they one hundred percent of them said yes. So this suggests a definitely a willingness to change across the um, career levels, but particularly at the lower levels of the organisation. Um, the next statement was carbon emissions take precedence when I decide if traveling to my usual place of work is worthwhile. This wasn't so positive and 58.1 um, said rarely, sometimes rarely or never. And just taking a look at some of the qualitative comments, well, enablers, well, having a shower close to my office allows me to run a cycle, um, commuting to work on foot by, or by bike um, is for health financial and carbon footprint reasons. Um, and also having the flexibility to work from home as well, because that, that isn't always the case. Um, in terms of the barriers, long lab hours means public transport isn't running when I need to travel home. 
and uh, this person felt working at home, they felt isolated by working at home because most of their teammates preferred to uh, work actually on um, in the uh, company. I feel excited about upgrading to new digital technology if it's more energy efficient. Over half of the respondents are selected either always or often. Um, I won't read out the uh, mobile responses across the career stages, but they were very different. Um, and it seems that the excitement of the new research opportunities is, is a motivator for those just starting out or at early career, um, early on in their career. But for senior level workers, the motivation seemed to be more to do with core values. And then moving up to the intermediate levels, the motivation seemed to be to save the institution money, which is probably influenced by their, their role and pressures within, within their job or within the organisation. I think about the link between storing data and its environmental impact. And you can see here, um, it's sort of trending towards rarely or never, sometimes um, rarely or never. The modal response was rarely across students, early careers and intermediate levels. By modal response um, at senior level was often or never. The most common barriers here was, I'm not aware of how much energy storing my data requires, followed by, I don't think about the link between storing data and the environmental impact. So there's clearly a need for people to be made aware of the link between storing data and the impact on the environment. And that came up a lot in the quality of comments as well. Um, I won't read through all of them, but you can see that these comments are suggesting that, that people, people just aren't aware they want, they want to be more sustainable, but they, they want to know how to do it as well. So the summary so far, there's lots of positive behavioral intention looking to reduce a carbon footprint and also positive explicit and implicit attitudes to low carbon, which is really good. Um, people are responsive to change. They do want to change and what are, they are willing to change, particularly those in lower grades. Um, sustainability um, in the workplace requires critical enablers and advice from teammates is a preferred and powerful enabler. Barriers uh, include feelings of low response efficacy, that, so feelings that those recommended action steps won't make a difference and uh, self-efficacy as well, that, that individual action steps won't make a difference. And there's also a lack of information. And when it comes to travel, um, the significant barriers are both with respect to traveling to work and traveling to conference. That didn't include that, that the travel to conferences um, within this talk though. Um, but we do clearly need to address these, these barriers. The next question is, how do these enablers and barriers connect to psychological profiles, for example, the intersection between explicit and implicit attitudes? So testing these different attitudes enabled us to do a segmentation analysis. So I've been working with um, a colleague at Edge Hill um, on this. And what we did was we categorized them into um, true greens. We call them true greens, hidden greens, surface greens and non-greens. True greens are those with a high explicit attitude and a high implicit attitude. The surface greens are those with a, those with a high explicit but lower um, implicit attitude. We've got hidden greens and that's those of people with um, low explicit but high implicit and non-greens who are low on, on both um, measures and that's how we operate as like, operationalized it here. The next focus here is uh, comparing the true greens with the surface greens. The true greens, just to remind you, they report a very strong pro-low carbon attitude and have a very strong pro-low um, implicit attitude. Surface greens report a very strong pro-low attitude, um, but have a weak pro-low implicit attitude. So very different psychologically. Just some preliminary observations. True greens highlight personal responsibility in overcoming barriers. And this is all the qualitative data here. It's I am willing to learn. And uh, the, the second statement that, um, that they were faced with a barrier, this person was faced with a barrier, but they actually changed to an electric car, even though it's more expensive. Um, and uh, if somebody says that they would happily uh, use uh, public transport if it was um, available. But when we look at the surface, surface screens, they down, down, downplay that personal responsibility in overcoming barriers. They refer it to other people. Um, it's a, when we are not being encouraged to work in an environmentally conscious manner, but it's, it's not their, their problem, it's somebody else's problem. We are never reminded, they're putting the blame elsewhere. It's not, it's not down to them. Um, and then True Greens um, highlights self-response efficacy. So um, when I worked on campus, I would frequently switch off monitors that others had left switch on. And on the previous slide, I didn't, I, did, I don't think I read that the previous statement, but they, uh, the um, Surface Greens said that, you know, they, they saw lots of 
computers left on, but they didn't say that they did anything about it. But these true greens are saying, when I worked on campus, I would frequently switch off monitors. I thought that's a really nice comparison there. Um, and making the environmental argument that storing all data is both intellectually efficient, uh, but also environmentally damaging, et cetera. So just conscious of time here. Um, so it's not uh, well, uh, surface greens downplay the self response efficacy, so just continuing. Um, it's not well demonstrated by sustainability research that individual action will be sufficient to avert a, to, um, a CO2 rise uh, by mean global temperatures. If I know more about how to do it, I would do. Um, our volumes are small, so any impact of choice would be insignificant. So conclusions and recommendations. So the research so far, and I say so far because it's I'm still um, analyzing the quality data, um, shows that behavioral intentions are good and attitudes are also good, but there are enablers and barriers which either facilitate or hinder action. And these clearly do need to be removed. Perceptions of barriers um, have psychological dimensions that and in that those with the conflicted explicit and implicit attitudes take less responsibility. So those who um, are high explicit, low implicit, they don't, they don't take responsibility for their actions. Um, so we need to remove that, we need to, we need to remedy that. And how do we do that? Well, we need to think about the messaging. We need to, we need to think about um, how we message around you know, institutions or companies. Um, and implicit attitudes are um, susceptible to emotional messaging, uh, powerful emotional messaging, um, and the importance of low carbon behavior. So we need to think about that. But strong communicative messages, messages are critically important. Um, any questions? And if you have any questions about this later on, please do email me as well, if you don't get a chance to, to ask me here. Amazing. Thank you so much, Laura. I was really looking forward to hearing your results because I, I saw so much of the survey whilst it was being built, so it's super interesting to see everything. Um, can I get you to stop sharing your screen and then we can see faces a bit better? Yes. I'm just going to scour and see. We've probably got about a minute or so for questions. Um, Mary, I could see you had a lot in the chat. Did you want to add anything or do you want me to pull out some of your questions? Pick your, uh, pick your top no, one just, question and we'll... <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm getting wildly excited about this. We just need to be careful. It's not generalizable to the whole community because it's a self-selected group. But what's interesting is the differences between groups. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see... Um, can any of this be turned into a practical tool? For example, check your greenness or check your carbon Definitely. awareness? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, you could imagine, you can imagine sort of um, having yeah. an implicit association test and people testing themselves every day and, you know, improving it over yeah. a duration. Yeah. I'd like to see it for senior leaders because that's, I guess, yeah. where I am. So, yeah. you know, maybe that's a conversation of, maybe that's, one of the recommendations in the report yeah. that yeah, so there's lots of recommendations into like. uh, check your group that Definitely you can then that. yeah yeah uh, 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 I'd love to see a board try it out and see who you know where do people fit I've uh, let's talk later about that I was just yeah, very definitely. excited by this yeah great thanks Mary uh, Martin I can see you've unmuted is there anything you wanted to add yeah no I'm I agree with Mary I think this is excellent a lot of exciting stuff I mean, the thing that seemed to come out there was, well, first of all, you reiterated this point that there's not much pressure that people are feeling and, and it would be helpful if there was some. Oh, but the other interesting thing was the importance of teamwork. And I yeah. thought maybe maybe there's something there and that's a way that we can encourage change is by encouraging people to work a bit more in teams and talk among themselves about the options yeah. that are available. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's... Does that, um, yeah, does is that is that consistent with your interpretation? That yeah, were... definitely, because, uh, and it's, it is, but I mean, like I say, there's like 52 pages of qualitative statements. I was so surprised because I always think, oh, you ask people to do a free response and they'll just skip past it, but there was so much. I was so impressed. It was great. Passionate. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, these comments, it, it is being, you know, reiterated in, in the qualitative statements as well. So, um, yeah, and it, it teamwork working together um and people feeling isolated when they don't have that option as well to to, to be sustainable um that yeah. came out as well because i hear anecdotally that some people feel a bit reluctant or 
have felt in the past. I think things are changing now. That it's become yeah. a, a socialised topic, as it was. It, it feels definitely, safer. Yeah. yeah, people are definitely becoming more aware and it, it, it's easier to talk about. It's more of a normal conversation now within the workplace, whereas, you know, not so long ago, it would be like, what's this? <laughs> yeah. Mm. But right. also lack of knowledge as well. I think that's really important that people just do not associate, uh, you know, sustainability with research they, they really don't I mean that that really did come out now I mean I did only just you know bring up a few questions here but if you know they just do not relate sustainability and, and research uh, and data storage or you know that, that was a really uh, strong point that came out thanks Laura Hi, right, I'm going to move us along so because there's so many things that we want to discuss and I'm sure sure we can have lots of discussions at the end so I'm going to pass us over to our final speaker which is Harriet and you're going to tell us about the art commission. Hi everyone thanks Poppy and thanks for that Laura um I was really fascinated listening to you talk about that I might follow up um so just one second I'll share my screen Can I just check with Poppy? Can you see my slides? Okay, great stuff. So everyone, as Poppy described at the very beginning of our session today, there's a segment of this scoping project uh, dedicated towards an artist commission. Now you might be wondering why and how, and that's why I'm here to speak to you. Um, so my name's Harriet Richardson. I'm a communications manager and I work for the National Center for Atmospheric Science. Poppy and I have been working on this together for a little short while now, um, and this is what's been going on so far. So a little bit about the why. So as you are all aware, um, this scoping project is UKRI wide, and so we mustn't forget that that also involves the arts and humanities. We might find when we conjure up thoughts of digital research infrastructure that we tend towards science and engineering and medicine perhaps. So um, the artist commission here is a way to address the challenge that we could foresee and were maybe actually physically finding with engaging with our stakeholders in the arts and in the humanities. So there's a there's a real great potential in involving those people um, who use digital research infrastructure in the arts and humanities in this scoping project. And this is just one of the ways that we're aiming to do that. So through commissioning an artist to create an artwork and run some stakeholder engagement activities, um, the aim was to stimulate and, and strengthen some conversation and some ideas that's going to lead us towards hopefully finding some, some solutions for this net zero challenge. So later on last year, sort of in the autumn time, we put out an open call for an art commission and um, we were able and delighted to um, commission someone um, who I'll introduce shortly. They're not here today, but I will get to introduce them. Um, and part of the commissioning process, the main sort of focus for the brief and for the artists that we were going to work with was that we really wanted to draw in some fresh perspectives. I think we can really find when we're collectively trying to address a challenge that we've maybe not found the solutions for just yet, it might be beneficial to maybe think outside the box and have some new ideas and some new approaches. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do with this. Um, and I guess that sense of bringing together our different communities, which is nice to hear, given that when we just finished Laura's Q&A, we were thinking about teamwork. So I guess there's an element here to continue that. So here's Paul. So this is the artist that we've commissioned to work with this from um, later on last year through to the summer this year. So this is Paul Milhouse smith um, he is currently in Nottingham installing an art exhibition. So that's why Paul couldn't be with us here today. Um, but that's his smiling face stood next to a 3D ceramic printer. Um, so Paul will be working with us to design not only a physical artwork, but also a sort of virtual creative art environment as well. Um, that's going to be stimulating some, some really interesting conversations across all of our research communities, regardless of the discipline. Um, 
And at the moment, some of you may have already attended. I think I see some names that I recognize and some of you might still get the chance to sign up to some sessions that Paul is running, which will be feeding directly into the work that Paul um, will be producing. And it's just so, so, so important in capturing some of the conversations that we're having around this space. So a little bit more about those workshops. Um, there's four in total. Uh, you can still express your interest to attend the final two. I'll give a bit more information on that at the end. So in the workshops, um, the people that attend are invited to think about their own attitudes and experiences towards um, digital research, maybe drawing on some of the questions that actually Laura and Charlotte were thinking about in their survey. Um, and then through some different techniques, we'll be sort of drawing out a little bit more of their thoughts around the future of digital research infrastructure and really giving them the space to explore about what it is they hold important about the research they do or the research that they support and the ways that that all happens currently in the world that we're living in and with the challenges we're facing with climate change. So everything that happens in these workshops will be taken by Paul to feed in to Paul's physical and virtual artworks. Um, I won't read this out, but this was some very encouraging feedback from an attendee at one of Paul's first workshops. Um, I think as a sort of personal development opportunity, it's nice to sort of maybe step out of your day to day. And I think this person found it really interesting and useful to think about their work from a different perspective by using art as a means to, to think about this challenge. I'm just going to give you some, some mini insights into some of the things that Paul will be producing. So as we said, everything that Paul is making is going to be inspired and drawing on conversations with um, all of you and further digital research infrastructure experts. Um, there's going to be a physical component, and this is going to be using um, some ceramics, as I understand it, um, an idea that they will be vessels of data and that they will be drawing on some of the world's earliest examples of capturing data through image and how we might use that now to capture the data and information we have about digital research. And then there'll be a virtual component, which will be like a sort of virtual reality space to experience the artwork in yourself. So this gives people a chance to experience the artwork remotely, wherever they might be. But this virtual artwork will also be um, portrayed and exhibited as an immersive installation at a, at a real place <laughs> that happens to be called the real store, <laughs> um, which is in Coventry. And that's the UK's first ever digital art gallery. So in the summer, people will be able to go and visit this, be immersed in this visual um, virtual environment and also go and see the physical ceramic artworks that Paul creates. So just to sort of capture everything that I've just said, um, the in-person and virtual artworks are going to be hoping to stimulate some further thinking and conversation around net zero, climate change, digital research infrastructure, and the future of research for, for UKRI in general. Um, we hope the experience of being involved in the art commission is going to be really um, key and like important for the people that have participated in it and the workshops in particular and um, I think we're just really excited that it's a way to bring disciplines together that we might not have done otherwise. Two final things so a call out to all of you here <laughs> some ways to get involved so this month in February there are two more opportunities to join some workshops with Paul there's one tomorrow morning. You can still express your interest to come. I believe there are still some spots free. And then there's one next week too on Tuesday. Um, if you aren't already, give CEDA and NCAS a follow online on Twitter or what other social media platform you like to use because we'll be posting about Paul's progress and any upcoming announcements about the Art Commission. And then a little later this year, 
you will have the opportunity to go and visit the artwork in person in Coventry and also visit, I say in inverted commas, online because it's going to be um, remotely accessible. Um, and I'm just truly very excited for you all to engage with this. Um, that's it from me, I think. So thanks, everyone. Amazing. Thanks so much, Harriet. Um, you have summarised it brilliantly. Um, and I'm just trying to see if anyone's got any questions and see how much time we've got left. So yeah, just to say to everyone, Poppy's popped a link in the chat if you do want to register for any of those creative workshops with Paul. And Mary said she had a blast, so you know, it's <laughs> going to be good. <laughs> Great recommendations from Mary. <laughs> Thanks, um, Mary. I was very sceptical. I thought I cannot give up three hours in a working day. I was wrong. Uh, so anyone who's a bit worried about the time, believe me, you'll you'll come out of it transformed. I almost thought, you know, that sounds a bit ridiculous and messianic, but it really was good. It does help you think differently. It is, it is very good. Right. Any questions for Harriet? If not, I will summarise some next steps because I anticipate there will be questions that we might want to cover about that. Um, Adrian, you've just commented in the chat saying there's some good potential follow-ons. I agree. There's lots for us to think about that I think we're going to try and combine into our final recommendations to you, Cara, I say. It's all coming together. It's great. It's a, it's a very big milestone in the project. So, yeah, thank you all so much for um, being part of it with us. Um, I can't see any questions. I'm just going to share a couple of slides and then we'll have some time for um, discussion. OK, so what next in the wider project? Um, we've kind of got two key activities over the next uh, six months. Um, so we're going to be doing lots of engaging with stakeholders and lots of report writing. So um, we have got a whole heap of meetings and events planned, coordinated predominantly by um, the core team. So the purpose of these various different events is to gather more evidence in areas that maybe we've got gaps or we need further confirmation on things. Um, that we've collected so far. Uh, we also want to share the project findings so far and then gather feedback and consensus about the findings and recommendations that we're making. And then the outputs from all of these meetings and events are going to feed into the final report and recommendations that we create. So I've just included a bit of a rough um, list of the upcoming events that we've got um, planned. Some of them are invitation only. Some of them are for maybe um, different stages of career. So we've got some early careers workshops that we're planning. Um, if any of them are of interest and you want to know more, get in touch with me and I can tell you more, but we will be advertising the ones which are open um, in due course. Okay, so the second activity that we're going to be focusing on is lots of project reports. So um, we have already written an interim report, which some of you may have already seen. So that was published in the summer last year. We're going to write another technical document similar to it um, in spring, so in the next couple of months. And it's going to summarise the project partners' work so far um, and the core activities that we've been doing. And that will have some more recommendations in it. And then we will also be producing kind of a final report, which is aimed at decision makers. So that will give a high level summary with the final overarching recommendations, which um, is due in June, which is when our project finishes. So alongside that, we're going to be creating lots of supporting materials aimed at the wider research community to share what we've done. Um, so those can, will be able to be reused by anyone to, to if you're interested in think that this is important and we'd appreciate your help in sharing those when the time comes. And then finally, we've got um, lots of opportunities for feedback to be given to us by various people at different stages of the report writing. So if you're interested in any of this, sign up to our mailing list, um, let us know and we can, we can share all of the outputs that are coming over the next six months. 
Okay.